묘호랜게교나무묘호랜게교나무묘호랜게교 And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone around the world. So our lecture today is about、uh, Bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect, and it's chapter twenty of the Lotus Sutra. And as we always do, we do begin with a recitation, and I invite you all to please join me for this. We're going to do this three times, and those of you who have read ahead will recognize this verse. I deeply revere you. I could never find you unworthy of respect, or put myself above you. For all of you are practicing the Bodhisattva way, and all of you will become Buddhas. I deeply revere you. I could never find you. Unworthy of respect, or put myself above you, for all of you are practicing the Bodhisattva way, and all of you will become Buddha. I deeply revere you. I could never find you unworthy of respect, or put myself above you, for all of you. Practicing the Bodhisattva way, and all of you will become Buddha. Okay, setting the scene. We'll begin. That some of you will may have noticed that the. Style of this text is is different,、um, maybe a little bit less mytho poetic, a little bit less expansive, and more in a common like literary style, and strongly characterized by、um, the the human touch. And this chapter, mo almost more than any other chapter, is speaking to、um, our our our. Directed to our daily life, and、um, okay, sorry. It's interesting to note too that the Angi Kuden has thirty points in chapter twenty, in chapter twenty, and that the chapter sixteen has only twenty-seven. So this this chapter clearly Nietzsche thought that this was was very very important.、Um, There's a new character that's introduced to us、uh, in this. It's called、um, Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Great Power Attained. And going to the Angi Kuden to break down what these three words mean,、uh, I'll share in a second. But I want to say that this is really not intended to be a, a person or a, a godlike being. This is really metaphorically a principle or a teaching. The word gainer、uh, or attained means manifested body. And that's the accommodative body or the historical body of the Buddha. The word "great" means the Dharma body, and the word、uh, "attained" means reward body. It can also mean a, se a second meaning is that gainer can mean provisional reality. Great can mean the middle way, and attained can mean emptiness. And the whole name represents the perfect unification of the three bodies of the Buddha and the three truths. And again, this is a stand-in for a teaching, and is not an actual being. And in chapter twenty of the Lotus Sutra, we're introduced to a beautiful bodhisattva in Sanskrit, Sada Paribhuta, which is never disparaging or never despising. And this particular translation translates as never unworthy of respect. And this bodhisattva never underestimates living beings or doubts everyone's capacity for Buddhahood. His message, her message, is: I know you possess Buddha nature, and you have the capacity to become a Buddha. And this is exactly the message of the Lotus Sutra. 
you, we are already bodhisattvas in the process of becoming Buddhas in the ultimate dimension. And you can become a Buddha in the historical dimension in your daily life right now. Buddha nature, the nature of enlightenment and love, is already within you. All you need to do is get in touch with it and manifest it. Never unworthy of respect, Bodhisattva is there to remind us of the essence of our true nature. And he or she represents patience, sincerity, and equanimity. And as we were thinking earlier that the literary style of this chapter is more of a more modern style, more oriented toward our daily life, this idea of this Bodhisattva He's brought to us in this common manner as a person walking around the world. So to use a colloquialism, he's just a dude living in the world, not a super bodhisattva living in a heavenly realm or some super arhat living in a monastery. Sada paribhuta, never unworthy of respect, literally means one who is always despised. So again, the literal translation is one who is always despised. And the Chinese name for this bodhisattva, Chang Bu Jing Pusa, resists any literal translation in English, which is why we have so many different versions of it. For this reason, most translators have modulated the adverb always or constantly to agree with the negative verb that follows. Uh, for example, does not respect or does not look down upon, does not disrespect or does not look down upon, rendering the bodhisattva's name never despise as in the former translation of from Cato or other similar variations such as never despising, never disparaging, never disrespectful, and so forth. Our translation provides a more affirmative and natural sounding English translation by also modulating the verb in a manner consistent with the chapter's narrative. Our translation is derived from the phrase that the Bodhisattva constantly repeats to other people as a sincere demonstration of reverence for them which, as the text makes clear, becomes the basis for the ascription of the Bodhisattva's name. I deeply revere you. I could never find you unworthy of respect. Kumarajiva's own translation of the Bodhisattva's name, literally, always not disrespecting, is also thought to have been derived from the chapter's content, literally, not daring to disrespect. Significantly, Kumarajiva's translation differs from the two possible normative understandings of the Sanskrit for this proper noun, Sada Paribhuta, one who is always despised, or Sada Paribhuta, which accords with the Dharma Raksas in 286 Common Era Chinese translation, and one who is never despised. However, the Japanese scholar Ueki Masatoshi puts forward the thesis that the name Sada Paribhuta is a wordplay that can be understood in as many as four different ways. Our translation has endeavored to allow for a multivalent reading. So that was a very long footnote that I thought was important to share so that we have a kind of a, a basic understanding. That footnote was from our, our current text that we are reading. And also this idea of uh, this chapter is, is a companion to the previous chapter, chapter 19, which was very much about teaching and sharing. And the thought, and Jackie Stone put this thought out, um, was that perhaps those who wrote this chapter, the Buddha, or those who wrote it, uh, added this chapter to chapter 19 because they worried that practitioners, like people just like you and I, would be overwhelmed and discouraged about sharing the teaching, thinking, this is far too hard for me. I, I just can't, I can't be a bodhisattva. I can't share this. I don't understand it whatever fill in the blank you have this concept of your own ability it was overwhelming and so the buddha thought okay let's take a different approach and they offer this new chapter of bodhisattva never unworthy respect which breaks it down that being a bodhisattva really can be as easy as simply respecting all life and the dignity of all life and then acting accordingly that that alone is really the essence of, of everything Okay. Now, we get into this next idea that um, when we first began our study, we said that the Lotus Sutra itself was broken up into two halves, the provisional half or the trace gate, and then the ultimate half or the um, Homan gate. And this, this idea is sort of limiting in that I think that there's only two aspects of the Lotus Sutra. Thich Nhat Hanh has proposed, and 
other people as well that there is really a third dimension going on in in this chapter. So we've got the historical that we understand. That's really chapters um, uh, one through um, uh, boy <clears throat> one through ten. Thank you. And then we get into the ultimate dimension, which is chapters eleven through twenty two. But the rest of the chapters that we get into really speak to the idea of how do we put this into practice, chapters 23 and 28. And of course, you'll say, well, Mark, chapter 20 is part of the ultimate. It's a division that doesn't stand up you know, to strict scrutiny and to view. I like to say that for me, just as how I like to look at the sutra, that chapter 20 starts to really present to us how we need to be in the world to express the provisional and the ultimate teachings. <clears throat> now, the next um, important slide that I want to share with you all is that there's several different ways to look at the sutra itself. And there's an internal view. So, all of, again, this is a mythopoetic story and through parables trying to teach us complicated ideas that um, the first way to look at this is internally. What is it describing for us? What states of consciousness and what states of emotion do we have that's going on inside us? And how can this text help us understand our own feelings and our own thoughts? And of course, the other idea is that uh, how does this affect our ability to walk around and be in the world. So our practice is the process journey and endeavor to integrate all aspects of our lives internally and externally, transforming us into a single minded being. So practice is integration. And we bring this spirit of Bodhisattva never despising this respecting the integrity and dignity of all life to ourselves and to other people. So the major themes of, of this chapter as we begin is that uh, this chapter represents the emotional core. Again, these three ideas. We've got the provisional idea, which is one could say the intellectual idea, like how does the provisional reality express itself in dependent origination? And then the uh, original gate, the Homon gate, chapter 16, talks about the lifespan of the Buddha or the moment itself has no beginning and no end, it's empty. Chapter 20 is really bringing to uh, this, I, what is the emotional core of, of the Lotus Sutra? What's the primary driving emotion behind our thoughts and our behaviors? And heart as in spirit in intention. And some of us uh, may have heard the Japanese word Jihi, and we were taught Jihi as part of growing, you know, becoming new to Buddhism. And there's many ways of translating Jihi. Uh, when I first learned it was like mercy, but the characters G and He really stand for loving kindness and compassion. So this is, of course, two of the four divine abodes, Metta and Karuna. So loving kindness and compassion is the heart of this, and it's expressed in the actions of this particular Bodhisattva. Uh, from the Shu Shun Tenno Gosho, Nichiren says, the heart of the practice of the Lotus Sutra is found in the never unworthy of respect chapter, chapter 20. Tian Tai interpreted this to mean that within one's heart, one possesses the understanding of Bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect. He interprets this understanding to mean the understanding that all living beings possess innate Buddhahood, to open up the Buddha nature that is innate in them. The Buddhas appear in the world. This is what the sutra means when it says, quote, to open the door of the Buddha wisdom to all living beings. That's from the Angi Kudin. The heart of the Buddha's lifetime of teachings is the Lotus Sutra, and the heart of the practice of the Lotus Sutra is found in the never unworthy chapter. What does Bodhisattva never unworthy of respect signify? The purpose of the appearance in this world of Shakyamuni Buddha, the Lord of Teachings, lies in his behavior as a human being. Respectfully, the wise may be called human, but the thoughtless are no more than animals. And this is Nichiren from the Three Kinds of Treasure uh, in the writings of Nichiren Daishon in Volume 1. Now, this is a 
this whole chapter is a is a is a role model. Bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect, is an archetype, uh, a role model, and this is about transformation. Uh, again, for those of us who came from the Soka Gakkai, we were talked taught about this is human revolution, but the same principle. This is in, you know transformation of ourselves to awaken ourselves to our Buddha nature and helping other people awaken as well. I did a quick survey and there are 50 mentions of the word transformation in the Lotus Sutra, 50. And the other word that is mentioned many times is single-minded. And there's 36 mentions of single-minded. Now, single-minded doesn't just mean I'm, I'm laser focused on something, you know, completely focused with nothing else in my mind. I think single-minded means that you have completely integrated all aspects of yourself and you are completely at that point focused on something. So it's your mind, your body, your emotions, everything is completely integrated, completely single-minded on the Buddhahood of yourself and others. And that is this process of transformation. Transformation can then be thought of as awakening. <clears throat> this idea of being not only mindful, but being bodyful as a single concentrated, loving, compassionate being as represented by this archetype of Bodhisattva never despise. Now, when we learn in chapter four, if you guys remember chapter four, way back in the day, <laughs> faith and understanding of the parable, the wealthy man, the poor son, one's self-perception determines our reality. So if we feel like we're unworthy, we're going to act like we're unworthy and we're going to treat other people like they're worthy. Or if we feel like we are worthy and everyone else has the Buddha nature and the dignity of life, sanctity of life, we'll begin to act that way. So this, this chapter is all about action and self-perception that guides us. This chapter is also about planting seeds. And Nichiren says, in this latter age, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo of the lifespan chapter, the heart of the essential teaching, should be planted as the seeds of Buddhahood for the first time in the hearts of all. The Lotus Sutra says, quote, I will leave this good medicine here for you. You should take it and not worry that it will not cure you. Quote, end quote. That was also from the teaching, practice, and proof of uh, Gosho. So you don't need to be a great scholar or expert practitioner. To, you just need to simply respect and be nice to people. It sounds super simple, but it's like super difficult as well. Just respect people, respect the dignity and sanctity of life, and treat yourself and others that way. It's also about patience. And we can be great masters of austerities and practices, yet still miss the point if one's heart is not open, compassionate, and loving. So we can put on the robes, we can do whatever we want to do, and we can be great practitioners, and we can be super knowledgeable, but if it doesn't come down to treating people with loving kindness and compassion, then we're not practicing as Bodhisattva Never Disparaging does. And again, this chapter does, like other chapters, get into this almost impossible to understand description of time frames, aeons, eras, kalpas you know, previous lifetimes. And it's like mind boggling to a point where it just becomes irrelevant. It's just like, I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. But I'd like to offer an idea that all these descriptions of unimaginably long time frames are just metaphorical. You know, throughout this time, Chakamuni Buddha sat in silence and the four groups were silent as well. Through the transcendent powers of the Buddha, the 50 lesser kalpas seemed to the great assembly to pass in but half a day. So this idea that these vast, unimaginably long time periods are really just moments. This is where I get this understanding is that 50 kalpas passes in half a day. So it's, rel it's relative. It's these time frames. They're not really super big, but I'd like to just sort of give you this analogy. Think about it for a moment. When you feel really awful and you're really suffering, doesn't that feel like an aeon? Doesn't that feel like a kalpa? Doesn't that feel like, wow, this is a whole lifetime? So it's time relativity and time dilation. The other important um, uh, theme in this chapter 
are all these people. And the Buddha says, hey, all those people who are throwing rocks and stones at Bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect, those are all of us. That was us in that time frame. And that person, Bodhisattva, never disparaging, that was me in that time frame. So really, again, what does it mean internally for us is that all of these people are us and they're aspects of us. They're parts of our personality. And then finally, caring is sharing. And it's not telling. It's not going up to somebody and saying, you're wrong. Let me tell you what, this is how it's supposed to be. This is true Buddhism. This is, everything else is, is, is nonsense. You know, I'm right, you're wrong. Pay attention, listen up, or you're going to, you know, spend thousands of years in the Avicii hell of suffering. Uh, caring for people is sharing things, not telling them. Uh, all right, so the next slide is about Sada Paribhuta, of course, as our translation says, Bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect. And never unworthy of respect is one of those figures appearing in the Lotus Sutra who depicts Shakyamuni as he carried out Buddhist practices in a former lifetime. He consistently venerates everyone he encounters, no matter who they are, including even those who attack or persecute him. Bowing in respect and reciting to each a phrase known as the 24 character Lotus Sutra. This name derives from the fact that the phrase consists of 24 Chinese characters in the Lotus Sutra's text and expresses the emotional core or essence of the Lotus Sutra's teachings and practice. It reads, quote, I have profound reverence for you. I would never dare treat you with disparagement or arrogance. Why? Because you will all practice the Bodhisattva way and will then be able to attain Buddhahood. This is the Lotus Sutra's meta an emotional core to respect the life of any and every person because each possesses the Buddha nature. The practice of Bodhisattva never unworthy of respect described in this chapter is our example of how to share the Dharma in today's world. While preaching this 24 character Lotus Sutra, never unworthy of respect is attacked by arrogant people who throw rocks and hit him with sticks but he perseveres in his practice of consistently praising them and treating them with respect. The sutra explains that it was through the benefit deriving from these actions that never unworthy of respect became a Buddha. Today's world is described as an age of contention or conflict, and the only way to resolve conflict and create a society of humanity and peace is for each person to believe in the Buddha nature of both themselves and others, and to consistently act in a manner that shows respect for people. Buddhism teaches the loftiest form of human behavior, actions that respect others, and encourages all people to act in this manner. Nichiren took never unworthy of respect as a personal model and strongly identified with him. He sowed the seeds of Buddhahood with 20, and he says in a Gosho, he sowed the seeds of Buddhahood with 24 characters, while I do so with just five characters, Myoho Renge Kyo. The age differs, but the Buddhahood realized is exactly the same. Again, the teaching, practice, and proof Gosho. Nichiren continues, quote, The heart of the Buddha's lifetime of teachings is the Lotus Sutra, and the heart of the practice of the Lotus Sutra is found in the Never Unworthy of Respect chapter. What does Bodhisattva Never Unworthy of Respect's profound respect for people signify? It's the purpose of the appearance in this world of Shakyamuni Buddha, the Lord of Teachings lies in his behavior as a human being. Like never unworthy of respect, to believe in one's Buddha nature and that of others. Bodhisattva never unworthy of respect has a theme song, which we're going to play for you right now. time in the world time enough for life to unfold all the precious things love has in store we have all the love in the world If that's all we have, you will find we need nothing more. If 
every step of the way will find us with the cares of the world far behind us we have all the time in the world just for now nothing more nothing less on the like to say that that was my theme song that I've given to Bodhisattva, <laughs> never unworthy of respect and uh, only love. Here's the, here's the lyrics. If you guys want to read them quickly, not to go over them, I won't read them out loud myself, but uh, to me, that's of course the, the great Louis Armstrong and we have all the time and the love, which was the, the theme song from On Her Majesty's Secret Service, uh, one of the James Bond films, which, by the way, I think is the best James Bond film ever made. Um, and um, Mark Lazenby was the uh, was the character, and he was he was terrific. Okay, let's go on now to the next. Uh, there's that self image. We go back to self image, which we talked a lot about in chapter four. And psychotherapists report that many people today uh, suffer from low self esteem, amongst other conditions. And they feel that they are worthless and have nothing to offer. And many of them sink into depression and can no longer function well or take care of themselves or their families. Therapists, healers, caregivers, teachers, religious leaders, and those who are close to someone who suffers in this way all have a duty, a responsibility, um, this bodhisattva spirit to help them see that their true nature is actually you know, something better that more clearly that they can free themselves from this delusions that they are worthless. If we know friends or family members who see themselves as worthless, powerless, incapable of doing anything good or meaningful, and this negative self-image has taken away all their happiness, we have to try and help our friend, our sister, our brother, our parent, spouse, or partner remove this complex. This is the action of Bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect. Whoops. Okay. So you, you, again, Bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect, um, is a role model uh, for us. And his confidence and faith and inclusiveness to free people from suffering, which is caused by their s negative self-image and helping them realize their true Buddha nature and showing by example this idea of awakening. And if we try to practice inclusiveness, then we are acting as this great Bodhisattva. Uh, and we can then be in touch with the emotional core of this archetype in any moment. So this archetype is not this person that lived in some period of time. Maybe he did, but for me, it's not really that important to understand. But it's like 
when we treat other people well, treat ourselves well, treat other people well with meta loving kindness and compassion, we're acting as this person. We become this person and our lives change, their lives change. We transform, we integrate, we become awake. And we practice this spirit of, of inclusiveness. It's manifested in us at this very moment. We get in touch with the great faith and insight that everyone is a bodhisattva becoming a Buddha. The insight that is the emotional core of the Lotus Sutra, carrying within our heart this deep confidence and trust, faith, namu, we have gained from this insight and sharing that confidence and insight with others. So practicing the path and liberating beings from suffering. This Bodhisattva spirit works to remove feelings of worthlessness and low self-esteem in people, encouraging and empowering them, reminding them that they too have Buddha nature, that they too are a wonder of life, that they too can achieve what a Buddha achieves. This is the great message of hope and confidence. And you remember twice now, I've had a big, huge slide that the Lotus Sutra's main message is hope. And I still say that that's the truth. And I believe that. And this, this chapter really brings it home. So this is the practice of a bodhisattva in action dimension. And for us, it's planting seeds. Now, this is a line from chapter 20. If in my former lifetimes I had not received, embraced, read, and recited this sutra and taught it for the benefit of others, I could never have quickly attained supreme perfect awakening. So the seed is planted in receiving, embracing, reading, reciting, and sharing. And then the effect is awakening. Quickly means immediately. So cause and effect are simultaneous. So our mission as we go forward is planting seeds. Now we don't know how long it will take to flower. So this is where the patience and kindness comes in and understanding that we can't force people to do anything. It's not our job. We can't control them. We can only really control ourselves. We can only determine how we react to things. So part of planting seeds is planting the seed kindly and lovingly and then realizing that we don't know how long it's going to take. This chapter, again, through these unimaginably long time frames, tries to disconnect ourselves from this idea that I do this and immediately that happens. We don't know how long it's going to be. So we can't force people to do stuff. Nor should we personalize what others think and say about us. So when we are doing things in the world, people say mean things to us. They treat us poorly. You know, throw, you know the metaphor was throwing sticks and stones, but sometimes, you know, words can hurt too. Actions can hurt as well. And the idea here is don't worry about it. The Example of Bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect, says, hey, don't take it personally. What others think and say says more about them than it does about us. And we then stand firm in our faith and trust and confidence in the Dharma, Namu, in our equanimity, always holding dear the idea that everyone has Buddha nature and given the right causes and conditions, can and will manifest it, thereby healing and transforming themselves and their world around them becomes a self-reinforcing influence for peace in the world. And as we talked earlier, this poor woman is suffering. And so her moment of suffering feels like a complete lifetime. You know, it's just, just like, it's never going to end. And I, I you know, get hopeless. And then this idea of time errors are metaphoric for, for that. And the, again, all these people that were throwing sticks and stones that are now here in the assembly, hearing Bodhisattva never unworthy of respect and, and awakening, they're all aspects. There's an internal view and there's an external view. And I'm focusing today on the internal view that they're all aspects of our psyche. So we're happy, we're sad, we're angry, we're depressed, we're excited, you know, anxious. These are all just aspects of our emotions, our thoughts, our mental formations, our constructs that, that we bring to this. These are all aspects of ourselves. And caring is sharing. You guys will all remember going back to chapter 13 that I said there's bodhisattvas all over, all around the world. And not, some are Buddhists and some are not Buddhists, but that doesn't change the fact that they're doing the work 
they're manifesting the qualities of bodhisattva, never disparaging. And Mr. Rogers, I think, is a, is an, is a wonderful example of, of this. And of course, he said, all of us at some time or other need help. Whether we're giving or receiving help, each one of us has something valuable to bring to this world. That's one of the things that connects us as neighbors. In our own way, each one of us is a giver and a receiver. Real strength has to do with helping others. Now, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I'll share my personal experience going way back when I was much, much, much younger. So this is many, many years ago. And when I first was exposed to Mr. Rogers, um, I, I didn't get him at all. And I said to myself, surely no one is that nice. And I was critical of him. And I thought he was kind of a simpleton or a charlatan or a fraud. I said to myself, this guy's full of shit. Nobody can be that nice. And man, he... Here I was, I'm throwing sticks and stones at him, right? I'm one of those dudes. I'm one of those people like, you know, belittling Bodhisattva, never disparaging. And I look back on that time, I go now, oh my, I'm embarrassed about it, right? You know, he actually made me mad. Uh, like, why don't I know people like that? How come my family is so mean? You know, what the heck? And I was like, wow, this is like this whole story of chapter 20 took place in my lifetime, you know? And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Now I'm going to share something else. Uh, okay. now, but in general. You've entirely missed the point of her, lady. the way. Thought maybe you could use some company. Oh, I'm sorry. For what? I enjoyed your speech. Very much. A travel show. I like that. I'm not sure everyone agrees with you. There are people in there who positively can't stand me. Well, I like you. I like you just the way you are. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm Julia. Hello, Julia. I'm Fred. Hello, Fred. I know I should probably go back in, but would you mind just sitting here with me for another moment? I wouldn't mind at all. Okay, well, I, I think that, that that video clip, I watch it over and over again. I, it's now on our website. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, I'd say that if you took everything about Chapter 20 and, and, and made a little movie about it, and it was two and a half minutes long, you just saw that. You, you just saw Chapter 20. I mean, Fred Rogers just sat down, saw this person suffering, sat down and said, you know, I, I like you just the way you are. You're a good person. That's it. So that, 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 that's it in a nutshell. Um, all right. So this, uh, the next idea is that we want to be able to see people with our, our Buddha eye. 
And this quote comes from uh, Hui Shi, which was Zhuri or Ten, Tian Tai's teacher, that looking upon every being as though they were a Buddha, joining your palms and venerating them as though revering the Buddha, you should also regard every being as a great bodhisattva and a good spiritual friend. So this is the practice of this great bodhisattva, to regard others with a compassionate, loving, and wise gaze and hold up to them the insight of their ultimate nature so that they can see themselves reflected there. I like you very much. I like you just the way you are. Many people have the idea that they are not good at anything. They are not able to be as successful as other people. They cannot be happy. They envy the accomplishments and social standing of others while regarding themselves as failures. If they do not have the same level of worldly success, again, self-image, self-esteem, faith, namu, trust and confidence in the message of the Lotus Sutra that everyone is a bodhisattva becoming a Buddha, practicing the path and liberating beings from suffering. This spirit helps remove feelings of worthlessness and low self-esteem. The spirit of never unworthy of respect works to encourage and empower people who feel this way, to remind them that they too have Buddha nature, they too are a wonder of life. This is the great message of hope. I'm repeating that again, but it was just so, so important. Whoops. And again, this is two lines from Thich Nhat Hanh. He has a meditation on, on loving kindness, but and I like them so much. And it's two people coming together and I am here for you when you suffer. So if someone's upset, you just go sit with them. Just, just, just go sit, hold their hand, just breathe with them. If they want to chant with you, great. It doesn't have to, you know, just go sit with them. And also in, in, in return, I know you were there for me when I suffer. There's a Gosho, the strategy of the Lotus Sutra. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this. This is a picture of Shicho Kingo. And of course, the title of this slide is Never Despise Yourself. And of course, never, never say never, right? <laughs> so try not to despise yourself. Masa Kato and Fan Kwai and Chang Lang had their failures. I'm going to stop there for a second. These are amazingly great, successful Chinese rulers and generals. They made mistakes. What is that saying? So what is Nichiren saying to Shijo Kingo? Relax. Everybody makes mistakes. Be nice to yourself. It's the heart that is important. What, what's your intention? What's your spirit? If you lack faith, it will be like trying to set fire to wet tinder. Spur yourself to muster the power of faith. Regard your life as wondrous. Employ the strategy of the Lotus Sutra before any other. These golden words will never prove false. The heart of strategy and swordsmanship derives from the mystic law. Have profound faith. A coward cannot have any of their prayers answered. This is written to Shijo Kingo. How often do we see others or even ourselves make the choice that after a hard day, we return home and what's the first thing we do? We reach for a glass of wine and instead of like meditating or taking a little bit of time for ourselves. Connie and I were watching a TV show and we were watching TV the other night and it's like every single show had the same scene. Hard day at work, came home, popped the wine and let's start drinking. It's like, geez, man, not to say you shouldn't have some wine. It's good, good to have, but have it in moderation. Why not run downstairs to the temple, you know, and, and, and meditate for two minutes, two minutes, and just take a moment to breathe and just collect yourself. Then go have a glass of wine. So what Nietzsche was saying is, he doesn't say employ the strategy of the Lotus Sutra always, only. He doesn't say only employ the strategy of the Lotus Sutra. He says do it first and then go out and do other things. Okay. So putting it into practice. This is a, a meditation. So, so those of you who have been coming to Wednesday nights um, and to a much lesser uh, extend on Thursdays. I do this almost every other Wednesday night for the meditation group that we do. Um, smiling to my body, I breathe in. Easing my body, I breathe out. Smiling to my body, I breathe in. Releasing tensions in my body, I breathe out. So why do we make this so important, this idea of smiling? Just the act of smiling 
triggers endorphins in yourself that starts to change your frame of mind. And even if you don't feel like smiling, trying to smile will produce the same effect. So kind of a silly way to say it, but fake it till you make it. And those of you who have, again, come will also recognize the technique that I teach us in meditation, which is if and when your mind wanders, which it will, because that's just what minds do, just notice it wandered and smile. Congratulate yourself for noticing. It's not that you made a mistake because minds will wander. So it's not like you're not doing it correctly the most accomplished meditator will always have their mind wander at some point. It's just how minds work, but they don't beat themselves up about it. They just smile. They notice it and they smile, and then they return to the sound of the daimoku or the sensation of the breath and begin again. And if your mind wanders one time, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, you go through this process of wander, notice, smile, return, begin again, begin ten, begin again ten times, begin again a hundred times, and so forth. Now, I'd like to extend this out. Our practice is our time in front of the gohonzon when we're actually practicing. Meditation is to your mind what going to the gym is to your body. So this is where we learn the skills on how to be bodhisattva, never unworthy of respect. We practice it in front of our gohonzon. So then when we're out in the world and we are going about our business and all of a sudden we realize that, wow, I would just spent the last five minutes telling myself how worthless I was or how I couldn't compare with somebody else or whatever the fantasy or mind trip that you're on. And you know, you go into this talk track and, you, and then you say, whoa, why am I doing that? And again, instead of like, leading to more recriminations and the more ideas that, oh, I'm worthless, I'm worthless. Say, take a moment, well, just notice it. Wow, I just was being mean to myself or I was just yelling at my friend. And it's like, why was I yelling at my friend? Why was I yelling at myself? Just notice it. Just take a moment and say, I woke up. I noticed it. Congratulations. Smile. Maybe it's not appropriate to smile in person in, in that situation, but smile internally and go, I woke up. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gohonzon. Thank you, Myoho Renge Kyo. And then return to the practice of respecting the dignity of life. This mnemonic, wander, notice, smile, return, begin again, becomes a tool that you can bring into your daily life so that you can start catching ahead of time these loops, these talk tracks, these negative self images before it starts to roll away and become this thought association train that takes you way far away from where you want to be Practicing this teaches you these skills on how to bring bodhisattva never disparaging into your life in the moment. Now, this next slide, of course, is a little silly, but people going to do what people going to do. Now, the interesting thing about Buddhism compared to God or Christianity or other, other faiths is that the Buddha isn't about imposing any punishments on people, um, but always saves them with great compassion. If they do not desire to see the Buddha or a person who transmits the Buddha, he never forces them to be saved, but calmly waits until the right moment, the time that they can extinguish their own personal karma. Again, we can't make people do anything. We lead by our example. All we can do is offer and invite. And remember, don't take things personally. Rest firmly in your equanimity. Mind wander, notice, smile, return, begin again. And understanding that how people react to us is more about them than it is about us. Our choice becomes how do we see them with our Buddha eye of compassion and that they too can and will someday awaken and show them the proper respect and friendship. So shoju or shakabuku, just a quick comment here, and we're almost out of time, but I'm gonna, this is a, another line from the teaching practice and proof gosho. When in public debate, Although the teachings that you advocate are perfectly consistent with the truth, you should never on that account be impolite or abusive or display a conceited attitude. Such conduct would be disgraceful. Order your thoughts and words and actions carefully and be prudent when you meet others in debate. Nitran said there are two methods of, show, of, of, of sharing, shoju and shakabuku, and they're like fire and water. Fire hates water, 
water detest fire, the practitioner of shoju laughs with scorn at shakabuku, the practitioner of shakabuku laments at the thought of shoju, when the country is full of evil people without wisdom, then shoju is the primary method to be applied, as described in the Peaceful Practices chapter, chapter 14. But at a time when there are many people of perverse views who slander the law, then shakobuku should come first, as described in the Never Unworthy of Respect chapter, in the latter age of the law. However, both shoju and shakobuku are to be used, the kaimoku show. So the reason I point this out and why I want to spend just a smidge of time on it is that Nichiren is equating Bodhisattva never unworthy of respect, bowing to everyone and saying, I see the Buddha in you. And this idea of loving kindness, this, this, this jihi, loving kindness and compassion is shakabuku, meaning that you don't have to be mean and disagreeable and angry when you're sharing the practice with other people. Matter of fact, quite the contrary. So you should be gentle and kind when you're direct, and then you should be gentle and kind when you're indirect. So the method is always respecting the dignity and sanctity of life. So how, how do we bring this to bear? It's basically just, you know, you've heard the expression, you're at a party or if the politician or you know, he's, he, they work, you know, he or she works the room. They go to every single person and they try and just, you know, talk to them, hear them, see them. I see you. I hear you. So go into the world and do your job using the special skills and gifts that you have to the best ability that you can and then just be there for people in an open genuine authentic manner so what does this all mean to us firstly like loving kindness it starts with yourself so respect yourself put your practice first not only thing you do but start with your practice that's the strategy of the Lotus sutra planting seeds Sharing is trusting the process of myoho. Share your heart with others. Be open and vulnerable. Be patient with yourself and others. Transformation and healing takes time and practice. Don't take what others think and say and do about you personally. That's their problem, not yours. You can't change people. You can only change yourself. So this is an exercise that I'd like to, like to encourage, invite <laughs> you all to do is take take a little moment later today tomorrow and write out a card uh, a small card and put it on your altar and write out the 24 characters of the heart of the lotus sutra which is i deeply respect you i dare not belittle you why is this because all of you practice the bodhisattva path and will become buddhas put it on your altar for a while and then chant about it. And you can use any of the translations that you want. So this is just the one that comes from the text that we're using, but there's other ones. And, you know, if you don't speak English as your primary language, you know, feel free to translate it into your into a language that makes sense for you. And if you want to have some little artistic license with the words, you know, feel free. Internalize this message. This is a really important message. This is just think about it, be with it. And so this is an exercise that, that I hope that you'll find a little time for yourself to do. And in conclusion, we've talked about this, that everything that we just talked about and read is contained in this meditation container of Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. And I hope that listening to today's talk is very encouraging and that you want to then practice this more and chant more and, and realize that you are worthy of respect. And so is everyone else. And that once we come to the world with that perspective we're going to stop hurting each other we're going to stop hurting ourselves we're going to stop hurting the planet because we're all interconnected we're all interbeing and we're all buddhas in the process of becoming buddhas with that i thank you so much for listening and thank you for putting up with my technical challenges i was trying a few different things all on my one little laptop and i i need like many screens to do this so thank you guys for being patient with me as i went through my technical hurdles let's uh, conclude amu myo ho ren ge kyo amu myo ho ren ge kyo amu myo ho ren ge kyo